So we have two guests today at this wonderful program. The first is Scott Akazaki. Scott Akazaki enters his 17th season with the Dodgers and sixth as the team director of Team Travel. The previous six seasons, he was manager of Team Travel following five seasons in the club's Asian Operations Department, most recently as the manager of Japanese Affairs. Akazaki, 39, was the first Asian American to be named to the post in Major League history, and is just the fifth Team Travel representative for the Dodgers since they moved to Los Angeles in 1958. Akazaki coordinates all of the Major League uh, clubs travel during spring training, the regular season, and the postseason. He, was spearhead he has spearheaded four international trips with the Dodgers traveling to China in 2008, Taiwan in 2010, and Australia in 2014, as well as organizing Major League Baseball's All-Star Japan Series following the 2014 season. A cum laude graduate of Claremont McKenna College, Akasaki double majored in government and legal affairs. He and his wife Tiffany, daughter Mia, and son Tim uh, Timothy Cole reside here in Pasadena, California. Also, Dave Roberts, David Ray Roberts is the 20th manager and the first minority manager in Dodger franchise history. He was born... He was born to an African-American father and Japanese mother in Okinawa, Japan. He graduated from UCLA in 1995. We won't hold that against him. <laughs> With a degree in history where he played baseball and holds the school's all-time leader in stolen bases, 109. Roberts played in, major, in the majors for 10 seasons, debuting with the Cleveland Indians on August 7, 1999, and continuing with the Dodgers, Red Sox, Padres, and Giants. He was the Dodgers' starting center fielder from 2002 to 2004. Following the conclusion of his playing career, he spent the 2010 season in San Diego's front office before becoming the Padres' first space coach from 2011 to 2013. He served as San Diego's bench coach from 2014 and 2015. He's the fourth to both play and manage the Los Angeles Dodgers, joining Tommy Lasorda, Bill Russell, and Glenn Hoffman. Roberts and his wife, Trisha, have been married for 18 years and have a son, Cole, and a daughter, Emerson. Without further ado, let me introduce Scott Akazaki and Dave Roberts. structure of this talk is for me to ask Dave some questions, so I first wanted to thank everybody for showing up here. Um, looking around the audience, I see half of the room is related to me by some... <laughs> me as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, in uh, researching uh, our our keynote speaker today, our speaker today, I did um, some very thorough, uh, in-depth research. I googled you and pulled up your Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as I read about you and understood more about you, um, there seems to be a recurring theme about your life, and that is that you have been you have been uh, surrounded by certain circumstances, and it's been very interesting to me to see and to understand the choices that you've made. So I want to ask you about uh, when you've gotten to a certain point in your life, why you went left or right or down the middle. Okay. Um, for those who may not know, Dave and I have a very close relationship. Uh, Dave is the manager of the team, and his office, or my office, is physically right next to his office. So whenever we want to talk, we don't call each other. Uh, we just kind of yell out the door, and then one of us, well, usually me, I go into his office. <laughs> and, we, and we talk about things. So uh, us sitting side by side is very natural. So um, as introduction was just mentioned. Dave um, grew up in San Diego, um, but before that, uh, he moved around a lot, uh, military bases and settled in San Diego. Talk about what, what was that like growing up, um, African-American father, Wayman, who's right here in the middle. And um, uh, Japanese mom, Eiko, right there in the middle. 
what that was like growing up and, um, and, and talk about the different things you did as a, as a child and, and, and what your upbringing was like. Yeah, uh, I'd like to echo, you know, Scott's uh, appreciation for, for you guys showing up and, you know, this is a great, um, this is exciting for me and thank you for showing up. Uh, I, I think for me it's one of those that that's all I knew and that was normal for my sister and I and my father served our country in the Marine Corps for 30 years and so it's one of those things, yeah, thank you. And, it's interesting, I was talking yesterday, ironically, to Howie Kendrick and Justin Turner about their kids and where Howie's kids are in one school and they're gonna stay in the same school for their du the duration, K through 12, and Justin moved around a lot as a youngster and as I did, and it forced me to befriend a lot of people and not be the shy kid around and to make friends. And I think that as I grew into, you know, adolescence into it as a young adult, that's kind of the person I evolved into. And it's helped me going forward uh, in, in baseball and school and just being approachable. And so um, it, it's, uh, it's one of those things that I look back and I think it definitely molded the person that I am. So in all the different situations that I've been, I've always tried to, you know, be true to myself and be relatable to people. And, you know, I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's from that point to where I am now, there's a lot of things that happened in between. But I can honestly say that I was true to myself throughout this whole path. And, you know, my uh, Scott mentioned the fork in the road and that's funny because that's something my mom talked to my sister and I about all the time. You can go this way or go this way. And fortunately, I went this way a couple times, but for the most part, I went. I took the, the right road and the right path. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I'm here. So one of the interesting uh, forks that I found uh, in your path uh, had to do with you in high school. Apparently, you were a very good football player. Um, and you had offers to play at some Division One schools, but instead you chose UCLA, and you weren't offered a baseball scholarship at UCLA, you had to walk on at UCLA. So why did you, you had um, free rides at, at, at to play football, but yet you chose UCLA, and you walked on there, why, why did you make that decision? Yeah, that was, uh, it, it's one of those things that it was, I remember being a senior, and I, uh, I was fortunate enough to be the senior class president, so I had to give the speech for our graduation. And at that point in time, I was committed to the Air Force Academy to play football there, knowing good and well, I really didn't want to go to the Air Force and serve for five years and play football and be in the Air Force, and that just wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to uh, enjoy college, and, and I didn't feel at where I was at, I needed that structure. Um, so I remember having a conversation with my dad saying, hey, if you don't want to go to, to the military, don't do it because of me, do what you want to do. And so at that point in time, I decided to talk to an old baseball coach that I had and we basically knocked down doors for, for SC, Santa Barbara, UCLA, Pepperdine, and UCLA. I had already got into uh, University of California, Berkeley. So as far as admissions, that was okay, that was easy. And so, and you're looking at the end of June and realizing I have nowhere to go to school. And so uh, I knew I wanted to play baseball and it's one of those things where I had a passion for baseball. I loved to play baseball. Football was always a love, but I really at that point in time I wanted to play baseball. And it was one of those things where I've kind of taken this, even to this day, is I bet on myself. And you know, for some, for, you know, that's one of the things that I talk to my kids about you know, doing something you love and enjoy, but also just bet on yourself. And I, I bet on myself. Um, so in 1993, um, you were draft eligible, and um, you were so good that you were taken, not in the first round, but in the 47th round. <laughs> of which, um, in, in 2016, there's only 40 rounds. So, 
so not necessarily where you wanted to be picked, right? So you went back to UCLA, um, and as was mentioned, you became the school's all-time stolen base leader, and that you were drafted in 1994, the 28th round, by the Detroit Tigers. So you're with the Detroit Tigers now in the minor leagues, and, and you're playing there for two years, and then um, I read that you became disillusioned with your professional career up to that point. You thought about quitting baseball, but you had a conversation with your father, and uh, you decided to continue. Tell us about that point in your life. Yeah, you know what? Uh, so from the 47th round to the uh, 28th round, there was a, a, a huge ascension, obviously, in the drafting for me. And I, I signed for a whopping $1,000. So. Uh, <laughs> So that was uh, money uh, spent uh, almost before I got it. But um, no, uh, so that, and that was actually the first time where I was a little, maybe more than irritated and disappointed where I was drafted because I felt that I played well at UCLA to earn a better opportunity and the draft status. But uh, my college roommate and really good friend of mine, Ryan McGuire, was a obviously UCLA, and he ended up signing the year prior, and he just told me that I need to get over it, and um, the game of baseball will move on without you, so if you think you're better than a, you know, a 28th round pick and a thousand dollar signee, then go show it, and so that was kind of my first, like, hit me between the eyes and said, okay, then go do it then, and quit pouting, and so uh, I went out and played, and so I, I performed for a couple years, and Next thing you know, I'm, I ended up uh, making the all-star team in, in A-ball, high A, and then get the next year, so I was looking for a promotion to double A, and I got sent to a lateral move, is what they called it, to a co-op team, which is a, a split of two teams and, and another uh, high A team. So I was disappointed, and I was gonna walk away, and I'm 25 at this time, and I talked to my dad, and it was one of those things where you're in a dorm, and we had pay phones, so uh, this young, man right here, this young boy, there's such thing as a payphone that we used to have. <laughs> so you have to, have to wait in line and you know, people from Latin America would talk to people back home and calling cards, and these little things that we used to have that we used to use a payphone, not a cell phone. So, so no, so I'd be waiting and then I'd end up you know, talking to my father and talking to my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, and you know, it's one of those things that, you know, you know, bow your neck, stick it, hang in there, and, and continue to fight. And so I had an opportunity, so talking to my dad and, you know, his advice and, and my wife and just really convinced me to, to just kind of embrace that challenge. And it was one of my best seasons I had in the minor leagues and ended up getting promotion later that year. And it's just one of those things that life's not easy. And, and I realized that at an early age, and it's what you make of it. And I think the people that knew me when I was a youngster and know me the way I am right now. I like to think I've evolved and matured and uh, have grown as a person, but I think intrinsically I'm still the same person. And, and uh, you can see me, I'm not a big guy, as Scott, Scott's one of my very, very good friends. And But uh, the way that I went about playing football, you know, baseball, just the way I am is I give everything I have. And I think that, um, the way I coached, the way I played, and the way I managed, I want that same thing for the people that I'm around. So um, it's really a simple formula, and I think it's just being who I am. And that's why uh, it's easy to have the different challenges or the people that I come across. Nothing is contrived. I, I just try to be authentic, and uh, you know, whatever happens, happens, I guess. So, um... In 1996, you almost thought of, of quitting baseball, as you said, you were 25 at the time. So fast forward to 1999, spring training, um, and one of the things that's um, uh, part of my job with the Dodgers is um, um, I help manage uh, the spring training camp that we have. And for anybody who's never been to spring training in Glendale, Arizona, it's actually only a five and a half hour drive if you want to make it next year. Um, but uh, we have about 65 players in camp, and they're all try to make, um, they all try to buy for 25 spots. So when we organize the camp with our 65 guys, we kind of feel like this is the 65 or, or 45 or so guys that we're gonna draw upon uh, during the, the upcoming season. So 
In 1999, Dave gets invited to Cleveland Indians uh, spring, big league spring training camp. By the end, of, so I, I think you, you feel like you, you have a shot to make this team. What's very interesting to note is by the end of 1999, the Cleveland Indians are in the, in the playoffs, and Dave plays in playoff games for the Cleveland Indians. So um, something, not a question, but something I wanted to illustrate is from a point where somebody who wanted to walk away, he stuck with it, and next thing you know, he's on national television playing in uh, very important games. Right, so. Yeah. Um, Dave and I talked about this. We actually rehearsed before we came out here. Um, uh, how we how we met. Um, I want to. Um, there is a uh, outfielder for the Miami Marlins by the name of Ichiro Suzuki, um, who, uh, depending on who you ask, is the all-time hit leader in the world. <laughs> but. Um, so when I first started working for the Dodgers, uh, my res I did a lot of research into players in Japan. So um, in the year 2000, that was my project, to gather all this information, present it to the higher-ups upstairs so we can uh, place a bid on Ichiro Suzuki. Well, we didn't win the bid, we came in second, all right? The Mariners came in first. So, um, that, the reason why there's a lot of politics, I'll tell you the backstory of it, but the, um, our general manager at the time, Kevin Malone, he had traded for a speedy outfielder from the Colorado Rockies named Tom Goodwin. And this was um, the end of, uh, two, this is the middle of 2000. So Tom Goodwin ended up not being very good. Right, and so it's the off season now, and, and we're going over our options. And Kevin Malone, because he traded for Tom Goodwin, didn't want to admit that he made a mistake, so he didn't want to try. Uh, he didn't want to take a chance on this five nine Japanese guy that nobody really heard of, who was hitting four hundred in Japan, because he had Tom Goodwin. Right? Why? Why would he need to? <laughs> so um, anyway, Ichiro goes to the Mariners. Right? We didn't place a very high bid. And uh, we don't have a leadoff hitter in 2001. So 2001, we have no leadoff hitter. So the off season of 2001, Kevin Malone um, goes out and he makes a trade for Dave Roberts, speedy outfielder for the Cleveland Indians. Um, he signs another outfielder by the name of McKay Christensen. And we have Tom Goodwin, of course, in spring training. So spring training 2002, we have three guys um, trying to be the center fielder leadoff guy for us, uh, Roberts, McKay Christensen, and Tom Goodwin. So um, that year, that spring, Dave hits 376 in spring training, I think leads our team in hits, um, and that's when I met Dave. So that's about 14 years ago. Um, can you talk about that spring and and what you, did you feel pressure going in that spring, trying to make the team be the leadoff guy? Because you obviously excelled. And, and um, what do you remember about 2002 in particular? Yeah, it, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a great. Uh, it started out in the winter as after I got traded. I remember I was living in San Diego, and we had these workouts in the winter at Dodger Stadium, and so I would drive up four times a week to go do the workouts. And uh, my agent, um, John Boggs, is good friends and represents Maury Wills. So John is the one who put me in touch with Maury Wills. So uh, at that point in time, I would drive up and then meet uh, Sean Green at South Coast Plaza, drop my car off. We would carpool from Costa Mesa up to Dodge Stadium, work out for a few hours, drive back, drop me off, and then do the same thing three other days throughout the week. So Sean and I, at that point in time, really didn't know each other and then became very, very good friends and still are to this day. And so at that point in time, that's when that relationship with Maury and myself forged. And so now you fast forward into spring training, it was an open competition and Jim Tracy was a manager. And for him to tell each of us, and Marquise Grissom was the other guy that was in the competition, said that whoever has the best spring is gonna be my starting center fielder. And I was the guy that was making the least amount of money, I had options, and so it, I was a long shot. But uh, I had a great spring, and I'll never forget the way that Jim Tracy 
kept his word. And I was the open day center fielder for the Dodgers. And for me to come back to LA after going to UCLA, have an opportunity for my friends and family to see me, that was something that one of the most special moments I've ever had, you know, taking that field uh, at Dodger Stadium against the Giants. And that uh, elation went away shortly after uh, Barry Bonds hit a home run in the first. And it just wasn't good. Yeah, but uh, prior to that, it was all good. It was great. <laughs> um, but that, that, that was a special spring for me and just a competition that I'll never forget. Uh, you talked about Maury Wills, and, and that's somebody that um, I wanted to uh, talk about. Um, so yesterday, while you were managing the game, um, I creeped into your office, and, uh, and, I, and I sat in your chair. I tried on your uniform. <laughs> And I met, uh, made a couple calls. Uh, no, but actually, I just, I just looked around your office, you know, like I had mentioned. His office and my office are next door to each other. And um, you have uh, very few photographs. You have a photograph of your family. You have uh, photographs of the, all the other Dodger managers because somebody put them up there, but not because of you chose them. You have a photograph of John Wooden. And you have a photograph of Maury Will stealing a base. Um, can you talk about what Maury Wills has meant to you, not only um, the, the, the lessons he's, he's given you as a, as a coach, but um, uh, as far as life is concerned as well? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a, you know, that's an, a very dynamic relationship that Maury and I have. Um, I knew of Maury Wills before I became a, a play for the Dodgers, but I didn't really know his story. And then so as I got to know him and I realized what a great baseball player he was and how much our careers paralleled one another. And so Maury and I have that mentor uh, relationship. He's a mentor, he's a friend, a father figure, coach, player, um, all those kind of different dynamics we have. And um, it's, it's, I think that he just really appreciated being an older player at that time when I was an active player and for me to be a sponge and really respect what he did and him as a person and wanted to get as much information from him as I could. So I think that he appreciated that. And from that point on, uh, we were just separate, we were inseparable. Um, and the way he went about teaching me and players, it came from his heart. And I think that he had so much knowledge that he wanted to pour into me. And I think that that was really cool because he wanted to pay it forward and give everything that he had and every advantage that he could give me on a baseball field, he wanted to give to me. And that helped me as a player and it also helped me as a coach and teacher because everything I give to these players is for their benefit, not for mine. And it's to just make them better people, better players. And Maury did that for me. Uh, so we worked hours upon hours on backfields talking about the game, working on my skill set with stealing bases or bunting and my craft, and preparing me physically, mentally, and I can honestly say that if there's, you know, as far as impacting my baseball career, uh, Coach Adams at UCLA and, and Maury Wills are the two that really uh, stand out for me. Um, and I know, you know, there's a, uh, and I'll lead into this, Scott. There's obviously, for most of you know that I won a World Series with the Red Sox, and that was something that not many people have a chance to do is win a World Championship. And um, I was a part of a great team. And this is a team that, ne that didn't win for 86 years. And so uh, I was traded from the Dodgers, and I uh, there's video that documents that I was in tears because I, I loved being with the Dodgers. I loved it in 2004. We were leading the division. I was at home in San Diego. I remember being at home in San Diego and getting a call from uh, the general manager at the time, um, uh, Dan Evans. Uh, it was uh, Dan Evans and saying that uh, I was just traded. Paul De Podesta, I'm sorry, Paul De Podesta called me and, and said I was traded. And so my wife, my son, my you know, my daughter, my wife was nine months pregnant at the time, eight months pregnant, and um, eight months pregnant. 
And so we were just sobbing, going, I'm going to the Red Sox, and I can't believe it. And so it turned out to be such a blessing and winning a World Series championship. But going back to Maury, I remember being at Vero Beach, he and I on the backfield and his little raspy voice saying, DR, you know, there's going to be a chance that everyone in the ballpark knows you're going to steal this base and you have to steal this base. You can't be afraid. And, um, and so as I took the field in Boston in game four against the, against the uh, Yankees, Mariano Rivera, Jorge Posada, Derek Jeter's out there shortstop, and I'm, it's cold at Fenway Park in October, and I'm thinking, the one person I'm thinking about is Maury Will, saying, this is what Maury talked about. And I was scared out of my wits because, you know, if I get thrown out, I'm thinking of Maury Wills on this shoulder, and I'm thinking of Bill Buckner on this shoulder. So I don't want to be Bill Buckner. I was like, God, please don't want to be Bill Buckner. So it's, it's Maury Wills fortunately won out. And it's like, come on, come on, Maury. Maury's like, come on, DR, you can do this. So there's three throwovers and one time I'm almost picked off, and at that point in time, my juices are going, my nerves are settled, and it's like, okay, this is my defining moment. I've, got, I've prepared, I'm ready for this opportunity, and so this is it. And so as I sprinted to second base, and I just believe that this game honors you. The game honors you the way you are a teammate, the way you prepare, and uh, the game honored me right there, and, and I was called safe, and it was a close play. And fortunately, there's no, it, there was no instant replay back then. Uh, so there might have been a twist of fate. But, uh, so ultimately, I, I scored the tying run. We end up proceed to win. Uh, I scored the tying run the next night as well. And we proceed to win eight straight games and, and uh, win the World Series. And it's something that uh, a lot of the credit goes to Maury Wills. So we actually have video of that, which um, wow. we're gonna we're gonna pull that up right now. So we're gonna we're gonna set this set the stage, okay? So the Red Sox are down uh, three games to zero, right? Bottom of the ninth inning, four to three is the score. Mariano Rivera, the best closer in Major League Baseball history, is in the game, right? Who gets to hit Millar? Uh, Kevin Millar walked. Okay, Kevin Millar walked, right? So he's really slow. So. <laughs> Uh, as mentioned, it's October in Boston, it's really cold, right? Dave Roberts says, okay, go pinch hit, right? So he has to steal second, right? Everybody knows he has to steal second, right? And so... And this is, this is kind of one of those things that, for, for, for the people that, uh, that don't know me, that's something that I really am... One of the things I'm most proud of is not even just stealing that base, but I think the, the Red Sox faithful really appreciate me as a blue-collar player in the sense that I came from the Dodgers, as a starting outfielder, I get traded to the Red Sox and was relegated to reserve role. And at that point in time, I could have bickered and complained, but I just checked my ego and was all about the team and tried to be the best possible teammate I could be. So if it called for being a cheerleader and team, cheer my teammates on or patting Johnny Damon on the butt and when he was struggling in the, the division series saying, we're going to need you, we're going to need big hits and keep your focus, stay positive, I did that. And it was watching video and, and studying uh, pictures. And if there's an opportunity that presented itself for me, that I had to be ready when called upon. And this is that moment. OK, so uh, can, we, can we roll the tape or the YouTube video? Yeah. <laughs> he does it well, of course, but it's not as good as him throwing his cutter on the outer half and letting it ride. A pinch runner, Dave Roberts, is going to come in for Boston. He can run. Picked up from the Dodgers. Miller still waiting for his first pitch. Roberts is going. Pisana's throw. Roberts. had a great jump. It was a good ball for Posada to throw on. Good call. Roberts was 38 for 41 in stolen bases. Nearly perfect. Now 
Miller will try to get him at least over to third base. Younger back then. <laughs> Almost nearly as well as, as I did back then. So, I don't know if people know, but you know, the Red Sox hadn't won a World Series since 1918. And again, to set the stage, um, uh, they were facing elimination. They had uh, Mariano Rivera in the game. Dave steals the base, scores the tying run. Red Sox go on to win the game. Then they win eight straight games. <laughs> to win their first championship since 1918. So that moment, that stolen base, was voted the most memorable moment in Red Sox history, that stolen base right now. So, um, um, we talked about the stolen base, we talked about Maury Wills, um, uh, let's let's step away from baseball for a second, okay? And so, and, um, I didn't know this about you, but you like wine, right? Um, That's an understatement. Yeah, but but, but in, in a in a different way than most people like wine, in that you have your own winery. So in 2008, you and some friends, including former teammate Rich Rulia, started Red Stitch Winery. Talk about why you're so passionate about wine. What's um, uh, why the wine business? Why the name? You know, and, and you know, why? Why are you? Why do you? Why do you? Um, why do you have this interest? Uh, beside, obviously, you're you're busy with your baseball career, but um, yeah, I, I think it started where um, first uh, I, I remember being a being a made minor league player, where obviously you have no money and you can't afford wine, and uh, so when I got to the big leagues. There were some veteran players that introduced me to wine and said, you know, you got a nice filet and you got to have some red wine with it. And I didn't really take too, too much to it. But after my 2002 year with the Dodgers, Sean Green and I with our wives went up to Napa. And when I got up there and met the people, because wine is so vast and can be intimidating when you're looking at wine lists and things like that. But then once I went up there and they're farmers, and the winemakers are just farmers or regular people that just have a passion for making wine. And then once I was up there and was hearing their stories and there was something about that place that allowed me to disconnect from my reality and the stresses of work and all this stuff. And my wife still to this day calls me Napa Dave. <laughs> and so, you know, when I'm in the middle of the season, she's like, gosh, I wish Napa Dave was here. You know? <laughs> So when I get up there, it's, I don't care about the phone, the baseball, I'm, I'm present is what she says. And for me, as a player, as a, as a coach and manager, it's hard, which is a fight for me all the time to be present because I, uh, my mind is constantly racing. And um, as a player, you're always thinking about performing and, and uh, the stresses of the day-to-day -day of, of a major league player. And so, um, so that place is some place that is the only place really for me that I really feel that I can really, really disconnect and, and uh, be present and outside of being at my own home. And so that was something I really took to. So as I got on and wanted to learn more about wine and as I was getting closer to the end of my career, I wanted to have to be in that business in some capacity, whether it's open up a wine shop or have my own label. So we found some fruit and it's just we make Cabernet, Pinot Noir, and Chardonnay, so uh, it's great. Red Stitch, my brother-in-law came up with the name. It's the stitches, obviously, on the baseball, and the story is not baseball, stolen base wine, and it's, it's, so it's, we want it to be a little bit more subtle, um, but the wine is, is fantastic, and so it's just something that it allows me to, you know, when you see your label on a wine list or we travel as a group, and those are fun little things that, uh, outside of baseball and family, that I really enjoy. Um, sort of a more more serious question about wine and baseball, but um, and I think many people in this room have been 
uh, touched in some way by, uh, by cancer. Um, in March 2010, you were diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, certainly something that you can, um, you know, certainly pump the brakes on your, on your life in a big way. Um, but by June 2011, you were given a clean bill of health. Please talk about your experiences with that and how that's changed your outlook on, on your life and your relationships with people. Yeah, that was, uh, that was, that was obviously a tough time for, for everyone. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, everything happened for a reason. I, I truly believe that. And so uh, I, I never, you know, f felt sorry for myself and um, great support for my family, which, uh, you know, and friends and fans. I mean, it, it was unbelievable, the, the pouring out the prayers and just, really feeling how much people love you. That was, that was kind of, uh, it, was, it was overwhelming. Um, but a quick story with that is, so in 2010, um, in 2009 I did some TV for the Red Sox. And then so in 2010, going into that spring, I was either gonna do TV again for the Red Sox or go in the front office for the Padres and Buddy Black, was the manager at the time try to convince me to go with the Padres in, in the front office and get away from TV. So as I contemplated which way to go, I decided to go the, the organizational way. And so I, I say this because when you do that, you have you go through the physicals that everyone has throughout spring training. And so when we we're in the middle of February, there was a node that was detected here in my neck. So as they kept an eye on it, and weeks later, it was detected that I had Hodgkin's lymphoma stage two. So I say this because if I would have went the TV route and not had the physical, Hodgkin's lymphoma is different than non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the sense that uh, it's quicker, but you can head it off, where non-Hodgkin's is slower, but it's hard to kind of track down. So mine was the more aggressive. So when you get past stage two, then it gets really, really dangerous. So if I would have waited another month or two, I don't know what my fate would have been. So it's kind of ironic that I ended up choosing to go with baseball as far as on the field with an organization and getting the physical. So um, it worked out really well. And so uh, I, my scans are, I have, you know, clear scans. And uh, like I said, everything happened for a reason, but it was a tough part of my life. and. Even at that point in time when I'm getting chemotherapy and uh, every other week, every two weeks. So one week I get it, I'm down. Then the next week I'm feeling pretty good. At that point in time, I was still scouting. And my wife was trying to deter me from going, but I was still going to minor league affiliates, you know, because that was what I signed up to do with the Padres. I was going to be in the front office and scout players. So uh, much to her dismay, I was still working. And that helped me sort of get through it too, because I felt I had some uh, relevance at that point in time. Um, okay, so last December you were named the manager of the Dodgers, right? So um, obviously a huge day in And one question that they asked is, uh, given your ethnic uh, background, um, you know, franchise that had Jackie Robinson and Don Newcomb and Sandy Koufax and Fernando Valenzuela, he don't know what Chanho Park, on and on and on. Um, you know, you're the first minority manager. Do you do you think about that from time to time? Do you think about um, what that means to you and and uh, the position that you're in? Um, I, I I think about it from time to time, but it, it's it's very few and far between. I, I think for me is, I just, I understand the gravity of this position and it's, it's I, I said initially, it's a dream job and every single day I come to the ballpark, I couldn't be happier. Um, but I think I'm just wired that I'm always trying to teach and not make it about myself. And although I realize how huge this responsibility is and to the uh, you know Japanese American community, to the African American community, to the UCLA faithful, and 
people that the Dodger, uh, you know, faithful, and, and there's a lot of people that have a vested interest in me uh, doing well and, and the team playing well. And so uh, I understand, you know, the, the, the names that you've mentioned and the history with the Dodger franchise and what it means uh, culturally to people, the diversity of the city of Los Angeles and the brand that the Dodgers have, you know, outside of this country is number one. I mean, with the, you look at the Dodgers and the Yankees, um, by far and away, you know, bigger than anyone. So I think that the Dodger organization the franchise reflects, you know, what America is today. So I think that, yes, I understand how important it is and um, how lucky and grateful I am, certainly. Uh, but uh, I, I just feel that I want to bring out the best in, in the players and represent the organization uh, the way it should be represented. And uh, so right now, you know, I look at it and I'm frustrated with the win-loss. Um, certainly I am, as frustrated as you guys are. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I do believe, though, is that this is something that building something from the inside out, I think that uh, we will see the fruits of this organization um, sooner than later. I know it. I believe it. Um, but I think that uh, that's kind of a lot of the process that I'm focused on and not necessarily I'm the manager of the Dodgers and I'm the first minority manager and all that kind of comes with it. It's I'm just so caught up in the day to day of, you know, my focus right now is winning the game tonight. That's all I care about. That's my only focus. Um, I, I think that people ask me, do you feel the pressure? My mom asks me all the time. She's always kind of <laughs> checking my pulse on how I'm doing. And it's, it's I'm 44 years old, so I, I, I can, you know, I appreciate my mom being my mom. But it's, I think that the way I handle things is, I, it's a micro focus on just kind of winning today, being better today. And I don't get, try to get to October because October is, so far away and it's out of my control right now. So I think the way I can kind of minimize that stress or pressure is just focusing on today. And that's what I try to get the players to focus on. And it's not easy, it's not easy. Um, there's outside distractions, but I think that uh, we're getting there. So, you know, you talk about your, your current team and, um, you know, as I was driving here, I thought about our team a lot and um, I, I feel like one of your biggest challenges, this is maybe just my opinion, is the diverse, the, di the diversity in our team in terms of the life experiences, who they are, where they come from, and, and so I think about, last night's starting pitcher is a 19 year old, um, very talented pitcher from Mexico. I think about our second baseman who's, um, you know, 37. Um, um, who's had different experiences in his life, he's a world champion. Um, I think about our uh, soon to be coming back a very dynamic outfielder from Cuba. And I, I think about um, our starting pitcher tomorrow, a uh, right-handed pitcher from Japan, Kenta Maeda. So, I mean, there's a whole lot of, there's a whole big spectrum of, of players that you have uh, on your team, not to mention you have the best pitcher in baseball. Um, so, talk about some of the different personalities and how you how your job is to manage that's why you're the manager um, all those personalities and, and get them to win what's what's that experience been like uh, you know, about three months into the job yeah I, I think that's that's been the uh, the biggest challenge and, and, and I say that in the best possible way because that's something that uh, I really um, enjoy and I have a passion for people and communication and that's what it is. It's it's managing each individual person differently. I'm not a big meeting guy. I don't hold court. Um, I think that when I first came to the big leagues, there was a lot of meetings that you had, but I just believe that everything is, a lot of it is, is it's gotta be team oriented and goal driven, team driven, but there's a lot of individuality on how people receive messages and how you gotta talk to players and reprimand them or challenge them. Um, and I do that in private and I don't like to embarrass players. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm very sensitive to everyone's background. Everyone has a different path for sure. And, um, but I, I believe that, you know, caring about players and wanting to teach and 
wanted to be for them and my coaches. I, I profess that to them daily. And um, we're about the players. It's always got to be about the players and getting the best out of them. So uh, it, it's a challenge. It's a challenge, but it's something that I, that I really enjoy. And it's hard when you get major league players, professional athletes that make a lot of money. And, you know, with social media and the self-promotion and, you know, guys have different agendas. But to get everybody on the same page uh, for one goal, it, it's, a, it's certainly it's a challenge. But uh, it, it's something that I, I enjoy. Well, congratulations, uh, Dave, for being such a great inspiration to the Dodger team. I know you have a lot to deal with, especially some of the younger players. Thank um, you. I just have a couple of questions. The first one is, um, in this year's All-Star Game, who do you think will represent the Dodgers? And the second question is, who will be in the Home Run Derby? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I... I I don't think Madison Bumgarner will be in the home run derby, <laughs> um, but I think I think Clayton, I think Kenley, and I'm pulling for Corey. I, I think that Corey is the, the best shortstop in the National League, and so uh, I'm pulling for for uh, those three. Um, as far as the home run derby, uh, you know what? I, I'm not too. Uh, I, I'm, I, I, I don't know who's going to represent uh, both leagues. I really don't. And, and I don't even check the stats as far as who's the home run leaders and things like that. I'm just so uh, entrenched in winning the series that we're playing. So uh, I have no idea. Um, but I, I don't think it'll be anyone from our team. <laughs> um, one last thing I'd like to ask you have you convey to your uh, team players. Uh, I know your um, role model is John Wooden, so could you tell your players make each day your masterpiece? Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great one. And uh, John Wooden is someone that uh, I did know, and uh, obviously ha have a tremendous and had a tremendous respect for, and his legacy obviously goes without saying. But uh, yeah, make every day your masterpiece. And there's you know the pyramid of success. There's a lot of things that uh, I pull from daily uh, from Coach Wood. That's that's a great one. Hi, Dave. I, I got the mic over here. Um, you've been a great role model for us in LA and, and just uh, inspiration uh, as a minority. But I'm gonna throw a little. And I had like ten questions, but I'm gonna throw a little curveball and pitch this over to Scott. Scott, you're also you know just listening here a, a role model and a lot of. Uh, up and coming uh, athletes, high school, whatever, you know, have aspirations to make it into professional sports, and you took a different path. I was wondering, maybe you could share a, a couple of thoughts for uh, us out here in your journey um, in getting into the Dodger system. Well, um, I don't know if you followed my athletic career, but um, <laughs> I was uh, such a good basketball player growing up. Uh, um, that I was so good, I made the Division Three uh, college team out of Claremont. And I was so good that I split time between the JV and the varsity team. So, uh, uh, but no, I, I grew up playing uh, in the leagues that we all know and, and um, um, uh, really loved baseball, but uh, I was better at basketball because you know, when I was in eighth grade, I was 5'9", five, 5'10", five, so what they make you do, play center, right? So, um, I did that, but I enjoyed playing so much, and it was always a passion of mine, and, and when I was going to school, I, I, I wanted to, well, I thought I was going to go to law school, but I couldn't stand reading about the law, really, <laughs> uh, which is a problem if you want to be a lawyer, I guess. So, um, but I really enjoyed reading the, uh, the, the sports page, um, and back then when we had newspapers, I would read the sports page every day, and I said, oh, I gotta get paid to read the sports page. That would be my dream job. So I ended up applying um, for a grant from my school, and I studied baseball in Japan, and uh, learned about high school, college, the draft, the pro league in Japan, and then brought that over to uh, the Dodgers. And that's a real like quick story, but um, that was 17 years ago. Um, and uh, that's how I got my start, and now I uh, get to travel with Dave all the time. So I have a question up top here. Hello. Um, Hello. I'm so nervous. <laughs> 
How are you? <laughs> so, first of all, Dodgers It's, it's so bright, we can't even see you, so it's, it's not, not, not even a problem. Yeah, don't be nervous. Um, Dodgers has been a big part of my life since my dad's watched it on TV, and I watched it with him. And I remember watching you steal bases, and I think you also gave to charity to each stolen base. Was that you? I did. Thank I did. you. Absolutely, that's right. Oh, good. good memory. <laughs> it was for the, for the youth. You know, every stolen base that, that I got, we do, I donated. Uh, my wife and I donated uh, money to each uh, for each stolen base. So, so it, it, it's funny is that I, I would think about that when I was playing. It's like I got it. You know, it's another thousand dollars. You know, whatever. So it was pretty cool. But I remember watching it every being able to watch every day, and that made me love baseball, specifically Dodgers more. So my question is, what is your current opinion, or how do you feel about the Dodgers not being televised on TV? <laughs> <laughs> and do you have any power? <laughs> Thank you. The, the, uh, the latter question is easy one. I don't have the power. <laughs> That's easy. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's very, uh, it, it, it's, it's a problem and it, it, it's disappointing for everyone, obviously. And, you know, you mentioned your father and, you know, your relationship and going to games, watching games. And that's what, that's what makes baseball great. One of the many things that makes baseball great, you know, and even just to have it on when you're eating dinner and listen to Vin and, you know, seeing certain plays and how you can really get to know the players and then you decide to go to a handful of games and, and it's like that just makes the summer uh, that much more uh, enriching. Um, so for me, you know, my first year as manager and, you know, Vin's last season, I mean, this is, it's disappointing, it really is, and I don't, uh, again, have any power or influence in that capacity and uh, I, I just, uh, it's unfortunate. I wish I could say something else. We have a question over here. Hi, Dave. Um, Andrew Freeman mentioned that when you interviewed, it seemed like you had the answer key. Can you give us an example of some of the questions and some of the answers you gave? And the second part is, since you're half African American and half Japanese, soul food or sushi? <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, uh, to the uh, Andrew Friedman question, I, I think it was one of those where I am a, I'm an old school baseball player, but uh, I try to pride myself on being a lifelong learner. I like that that uh, that term, lifelong learner, and have the growth mindset. And I think that they appreciate the fact that when you've got analytics and you've got the eye test, and you can kind of marry the two, um, that I was, I was, you know, and, and being able to communicate with players and manage above and manage media, um, in game and all these different variables that come with man, being a major league manager, I think that it made sense. And I think for me, it was what, uh, I truly believed in. And it was easy because nothing had to be contrived. If I felt that one of the questions was, what would I have done with Jock Peterson last year when he struggled in the second half? And I said, I would have sent him to the minor leagues. And I think the easy question, answer for me would have been, you stick with him because he's one of your young guys and you got to show him you care about him. And because that's what they did. But me knowing what the Dodger organization chose to do last year with Jock Peterson, I went against the grain and gave my honest opinion. I thought they should have sent him out and let him catch his breath. And so uh, a lot of the questions I interviewed for the Mariners job as well, and the Mariners job was more of what are my qualifications to be the man manager for the Mariners, where the Dodgers were put yourself in the manager's chair and how would you manage this club and all the dynamics of, and things that come with being the manager for the Dodgers. So I had to replay the postseason series against the Mets last year and what would I have done different than Donnie or all these different things. Um, so, and, and certainly, and there were some things that I said, you know what, Donnie did everything right. And uh, the players didn't get the hit when they needed to and he handled, you know, the, the altercation with 
eighth year the right way and tried to defuse it or whatever that they had in the postseason. And so, um, so things like that I, I had to do. Uh, and it was long. It was a long process. It was a long process, and I was clearly vetted. Um, but uh, it, you know, I, I couldn't be happier, obviously, with the result. And as far as the soul food versus uh, sushi, <laughs> Japanese food. Um, I had sushi last night. I could uh, I, I could eat sushi every I could eat Japanese food and sushi every single day. <laughs> Soul food I, I have to pick my spots. Um, but uh, you know black eyed peas. You know I, you can't beat that. Uh, fried chicken, fried chicken and waffles. I'm a I like it all. All right. Uh, okay. Uh... First of all, hi, Mr. Roberts. Hey, buddy, how you doing? What's your name? Uh, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Uh, also, I'm doing great today. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. Uh, so am I. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I'm really happy to have you here. Um, you're one of the best players in the game. Thank you. Uh, I'm really happy to have you here. Um, I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on uh, the Mar Garcia Parra being traded, as well as other fellow Red Sox team members? Uh, no more Garcia. Wow. <laughs> you know Nomar Garcia Parra, huh, as a player. Wow, that's good. That's good. He was a, well, first of all, he was a great player. And um, I actually, when I got traded to the Red Sox, I took his locker. And um, so that was pretty cool for me. And he was a great player, and he got traded to the Cubs at that point, I think. And it was more of the Red Sox felt that they needed a defensive guy to catch the ball. And so they traded for Orlando Cabrera. Orlando Cabrera. They needed a speed guy in me, and they traded for our first baseman, Doug McCabe. So we traded for some little pieces to make that Red Sox team uh, complete. But uh, so I never played with Nomar, but he's a good friend of mine to this day, and obviously does TV for the Dodgers. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was weird that whole trade thing. But I, I wanted to be with the Dodgers, but everything worked out. What was your other question, buddy? Was there another one? Uh, no. Okay, thanks, Andrew. <laughs> Hello, Andrew. Hi, Dave. Hey, how are you doing? I'm also doing good. That's good. <laughs> so I wanted to ask more of a cultural question. Um, it seems to me that you have probably four parts culturally that make you up. You have an African-American side, you have a Japanese side, you also have a military um, side and a baseball culture. Yeah. Now, do you feel that when you're in different roles that there's a certain ethnic identity that takes over? Like, for example, when you're managing, do you turn into, uh, I don't know, do you have, basically, do you have different cultures that dominate different aspects of your life? The way I think many of us who are multicultural feel that we do. That's a great question. And, and I think that uh, I have, um, let's take the, um, you know what, I, I think that they all apply. I think all the, the things that you've mentioned, I have made a concerted effort in the last five years of my life. I'm 44 right now. In the last five years of my life, I've made a concerted effort to be the same person. And I think that as I was growing up and you're trying to identify with certain groups and, and certain people, and, and I consider myself a person that tries to bring people together. And I went to high school with, you know, white, black, Mexican, Samoan, I mean, Japanese, I mean, all, all, all the whole gamut. And, and I think that uh, I, was, I felt I could relate to everybody. Um, but I, I try to just be who I am. And I think that that's, for me, is, you know, do I associate with the African-American side, the Japanese side, the baseball side, um, what, what, what am I? And I think that for me, being in a military background and where we moved around my entire life, there's a lot of uh, interracial, racial, uh, you know, marriages and kids. And so there was, there was a point when I was young, I was like, God, what am I? You know, and, and I think that as I went through, you know, then I was a baseball player. But I just really, and even going through that process <laughs> that you asked about the Andrew Friedman interview process where I was who I, I am, I am who I am. And it's kind of, that's why I've learned that it's the easiest way for me to be in front of people regardless of who they are in any capacity. And even when I'm managing, the X's and O's and I'm managing a baseball game, but my relations with umpires, players, coaches is still who I am. And so I don't change. 
I might be a little bit more intense and focused, I guess, when I'm, you know, because every pitch is important, but I still kind of am who I am. And, and this is, like I said, in the last four to five years, I've really tried to just be who I am. And so I don't know if that even answers your question, but I think for me that's the easiest way that uh, I kind of get through my life. You know, I want to touch upon that one real quick. Um, I think I think Dave um, does things naturally throughout his life, and I'll give you an example of something that happened to me this morning. Um, so I have three kids, ages 10 months, three, and five. And amazingly, my wife and I were up before them today. And so, my wife made me coffee, and, um, and we were sitting there by ourselves having coffee. And she was drinking her coffee, and she's not Japanese. And I was there drinking my coffee, and I was slurping my coffee. And she says, why are you slurping your coffee? And then I, I looked at her, and I was like, I do that as well, right? right? And then it's a Japanese thing, but I didn't, I didn't go, oh, it's a Japanese thing, you wouldn't understand. But it, it truly is, right? It, it's, it's like the way you, you drink your hot drink that, or your soup. And, you know, like my dad does it all the time, right? When we go to our family dinners and he's like, <laughs> right? But, you know, it's, it's just a way to cool off the, so you don't burn your tongue. But anyway. It's a sort of like a subconscious thing that you know we, we do and we don't even know that that makes a, makes us who we are. Hi, coach. Hey, buddy. <laughs> who is your favorite player on the Dodgers? Pick one. <laughs> player on the Dodgers is Trace Thompson. If I could just add, uh, I know as a mixed person, I'm Mexican and black, I was, uh, my parents are in the service, so we, we transferred around. Uh, but I want you to know, um, we're actually having the first Mixed Heritage Day at Dodgers Stadium um, on August 27th. Shameless plug, sorry. That's um, great. Oh, that's um, great. But you mentioned Trace and yourself. Um, I want you to know how important it is for, these are my mixed children, to see reflections of themselves, and I appreciate it. And so I know you downplay it, but it's very important, and I thank you. Thank you so much. That's great. Please give a big hand to our, our, our people.